Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from SkinCeuticals. Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia Ferris. I'm a board certified dermatologist and a clinical associate professor at Tulane University. I want to welcome you to this program titled Compass to Topical Antioxidants in Cosmeceuticals, Why, What, When, and How. Joining me today is my colleague and good friend, Dr. Giuseppe Vallocchi. Dr. Vallocchi is an Associate Professor of Regenerative Medicine in the Department of Animal Science at NC State University. He is well known for his expertise and research on the environmental factors that impact skin aging and particularly how these factors influence skin aging through oxidative stress. I am delighted to have him here with me today to discuss what we think is a very important subject. We know that oxidative stress plays a major role in the aging process, and it's particularly an important factor in skin aging. Today, we'll talk about what causes oxidative stress in the skin and what can be done to combat it. The free radical theory of aging was first proposed by Denham Harmon in the mid-1950s. Since that time, there have been numerous studies confirming that accumulation of reactive oxygen species occurs as a result of cellular processes such as respiration, but also as a result of exogenous factors that we now refer to as the exposome. The exposome is defined as the sum total of all the environmental factors that an individual is exposed to over their lifetime. This includes things such as ultraviolet light, pollution, cigarettes, poor nutrition, lack of sleep, stress, and even temperature. The common thread through all of these exposomal factors is that they induce oxidative stress. Now as dermatologists, of course, we are hyper-focused on the UV and the effect of UV on skin aging. We know that ultraviolet light affects skin, accelerating aging, and also causes carcinogenesis. UVB and UVA act very differently in the skin. UVB is a short wavelength of light, doesn't penetrate very deeply, but it's very effectively absorbed by the chromophores in the skin, particularly DNA, causing DNA damage and carcinogenesis. In contrast, ultraviolet A or UVA penetrates more deeply into the skin. It causes oxidative stress, upregulating reactive oxygen species, and turning on a variety of transcription factors that contribute to skin aging. Number one, activator protein one. This transcription factor encodes for the metalloprotease enzymes that break down collagen and also downregulates procollagen expression. So we have an increase in collagen breakdown and a decrease in collagen production. So this is the net loss of collagen, and this weakens the extracellular matrix. We also know that it upregulates transcription factor nuclear factor kappa beta, or NFKB. This is responsible for the production of a variety of pro-inflammatory mediators, what we call so-called inflammaging. It's also important to remember that longer wavelengths of light, such as visible light, and even infrared play a role in skin aging. These two trigger oxidative stress, so they act much like ultraviolet A, and they upregulate the same types of transcription factors we see upregulated by ultraviolet light. Now, I'd like to ask Dr. Balaki to elaborate on what pollutants do to the skin and how do they contribute to skin aging. Thank you, Dr. Paris, for the introduction. And yes, as we all know, uh, UV light is very harmful to the skin, but uh, as has been just mentioned earlier, our skin is not exposed only to UV lights, but there are a lot of factors that can affect the skin. And indeed, the exposome concept summarizes all of them. So if we talk about pollution or outdoor, outdoor stressors, 
we have to think that uh, is one word, but it means a lot of uh, uh, subjects. Uh, recently, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, helped us in uh, group these pollutants, mainly in six, in six subjects, which are the lead, metal, and industrial products, the nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxide, carbon monoxide, that can be also uh, defined as a cigarette smoke, because I would like also to mention that in the last few five years, the cigarette smoke is considered a pollutant. Ozone, of course, the trop tropospheric ozone, and a particulate matter. Now, if we think of all these pollutants, we don't need to be a chemist to understand that these pollutants are different. They have physical and chemical properties. They are different. Some are gas in the gas phase, some are particulates. And uh, it's easy to understand, therefore, that maybe the, their action, the way how they can interact with our organism is different. Indeed, has been now shown, for example, for particulate matter, that uh, is very difficult for PMs, particulate matters, uh, to penetrate the skin, especially for the large size of particulate matter. Uh, they can, of course, enter the skin if the skin is damaged, or there are some theories where very ultra-fine PM can actually use the hair follicle and sebocyte via to get into the skin. On the other hand, for sure we know that ozone is not able to penetrate the skin, but the effect of ozone, I will summarize later, is actually mainly due to it interaction with the lipids that are in the stratum corneum of the skin. About the UV, as has been uh, mentioned earlier, depends on the wavelength, they can hit the skin more deeper or at the upper layer. And uh, on the other hand, cigarette smoke has been shown to really affect the skin at different stages and layers because it's characterized by a particulate and a gas phase that can interact on different targets. One thing that we need to, um, to understand is that independently of their way of action, all these pollutants have a common denominator that can be uh, defined as a ROS, oxidative stress, but because the ROS are very <clears throat> quick, uh, compounds, usually you are not able to really um, catch them in lively uh, subjects. But what you can measure is the damage that they do. And one of these is defined peroxidation, which is the oxidation of lipids. So <clears throat> if we look briefly of how these compounds act, for example, we know that uh, cigarette smoke is able to induce a cascade of effect. One is through the HR receptor, which is the aryl receptor and is a receptor that recognize cyanobiotic because our body recognize these pollutants as something that is not self. It's something that we have to fight against. So the HR receptor activates a cascade of uh, uh, enzymes among which there are the MMPs, as mentioned earlier. Of course, cigarette smoke is able to also generate uh, oxidation. And all of these lead to a degradation of the matrix and, uh, of course, collagen. And that leads to a dermal matrix breakdown and, of course, wrinkle formation. In addition, we recently show that uh, cigarette smoke is able to stimulate endogenous production of oxidative stress. So is like a positive feedback that damage further the skin. And indeed, we all know that uh, or now more than 30 years ago, it's very easy to understand the damage of a cigarette smoke as uh, is also defined the smoker phase. Cigarette smoke is not only uh, compound that can affect the skin, but the other is particulate matter. And uh, this is a very 
a complicated uh, reaction just because particulate matter is one word, but one important fact is uh, actually how these uh, uh, compounds are generated. So <clears throat> depends on the source, they have a different way of action, but the main uh, compounds that really make this particulate matter very reactive are the metal that are in the uh, outdoor of the particles. These are able to generate reactive oxygen species to activate the mitochondrial uh, release of oxidants. And again, this can just lead to a activation transcription factor as mentioned earlier, such as AP1 and FKB, that lead to increase of pro-inflammatory response. All this <clears throat> is actually being shown recently in, a, in this paper where, as you can see, using a 3D model, the authors, and uh, uh, was my group, was able to show an increase inflammatory response of the epidermal uh, layer and increased damage as shown by apoptotic, apoptotic cells, the brown one. But even more, we were able to show that uh, the particles are able over time to penetrate through the stratum corneum and reach the alive cells of the epidermis. And this could explain a recent study by Krutman group that actually clearly show that people that live in urban area next to very trafficated streets actually develop an increase of 22% hyperpigmentation. <clears throat> but uh, we don't have only, as I mentioned to you, particulate matter as cigarette smoke, but a very important pollutants that uh, I like to call a silent killer is uh, ozone. Ozone is able to interact with the skin on the stratum corneum, where it generates a cascade of molecules that we can summarize mainly in two groups, aldehydes and ROS. And indeed, has been well shown, for example, in this slide, that the skin exposed to ozone increases the formation of this aldehyde, this peroxidation product, either in vivo also in 3D models, as you can see from the green color, is actually able to reach even the nucleus. And this means that can really activate and modulate transcription factor. But also ozone, with the, when it interacts with the skin, is able to generate ROS, as has been shown by our group and also others, that uh, you have a clearly increase of hydrogen peroxide and ROS in general after the skin of keratinocyte are directly exposed to tropospheric ozone at doses that we breathe daily. So <clears throat> what I, I like to underline here is that we have a positive feedback that actually leads to a formation of a peroxidation ROS. These talk to each other and these generate more ROS that then are going to affect the membrane and uh, even damage a DNA and lead, of course, to a skin uh, conditions. So if we wanna summarize briefly the way how pollutants act, we can say that they act at different stages. They can, of course, impair the skin barrier. And this means that can actually be the trig for other pollutants or, or um, stressors to get into the skin because they can prime this damage. They can generate free radicals. They then are, of course, activator of an inflammatory cascade. But all of these feed itself thanks to the activation of ROS that further you know, activate an inflammatory cascade. So we can also say that uh, as I mentioned to you, a common denominator of all these factors is yes, the ROS production, but is mainly the ability to generate peroxidative products. These peroxidative products has been shown to have a long lasting effect on very key molecules and transcription factor that then can lead 
to the skin damage and what, as I mentioned here in this paper, a premature aging and even some very uh, damaging conditions such as atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. One thing that we should take into consideration that the skin is not such a weak organ. The skin is a very strong organ and indeed the skin is characterized by the very <coughs> strong antioxidant defense that can be enzymatic as uh, we all know such as uh, superoxide dismutase, catalase, etc., but also non-enzymatic that actually are all the products, all the compounds that we are able to get mainly through the diet. One thing that is, uh, I, I like to mention is that uh, all these antioxidants, as they are called, they talk to each other. They are part of a big crosstalk that uh, they actually help each other to regenerate and to be even more functional. That's why I, I always suggest not to be focused on only one molecule, but it's better a multi-molecule when you try to fight oxidative stress. Of course, when the damage is overwhelming, this system it cannot cope with the oxidative damage. And so you have a oxidative condition that uh, you can, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, is, is represented by this uh, uh, balance scale between ROS and antioxidant skin defense. So that is so fascinating, particularly the way all the pollutants act in different ways and don't even have to penetrate the skin in the case of ozone to cause uh, skin damage. Um, you know, we'll take this a little bit into the clinical realm now. So what are we seeing as dermatologists when the skin gets overwhelmed with oxidative stress? What does environmental skin aging look like? And I think all of us understand that when we examine a patient, what we're really seeing is intrinsic aging or natural aging superimposed with environmental aging. So it's very hard to tease the two out when we look clinically. But there's certainly things that we recognize as dermatologists that are part of this extrinsic or environmental aging. And this is deep, coarse wrinkles. You know, these are very different than the wrinkles of intrinsically aged skin. These are deep and very coarse. We see lots of discoloration, hyperpigmentation, model pigmentation, brown spots, as you mentioned earlier, both from ultraviolet light and from pollutants. We also see telangiectasia formation, redness of the skin, you get that sort of yellow sallowness that we associate um, with solar elastosis, and even things like actinic purpura, which are very, very common in patients who've had extensive amounts of sun exposure. So the clinical picture, I think we can all agree that the environmental factors really contribute most to what our patients are concerned about when they look at their skin aging. Now, I think at this point, it's probably abundantly clear that we need to boost the antioxidant reserve in our skin. Sunscreens and sunblocks are not enough, and studies have shown that they do not adequately protect against UV-induced reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress, and they also do not do a great job at protecting against those longer wavelengths of light that we talked about, visible light and infrared, and the uh, reactive oxygen species that are produced as a result of that exposure. So we like to now look at new environmental protection, a more updated approach where we couple our sun protecting um, ingredients or our sun protecting products with topical antioxidants in order to provide some additional protection against oxidative stress. And I often refer to these as the inactive protectors and the active protectors. So the inactive protectors are the sunscreens that just basically block the sunlight and the protective clothing that block the sun from getting to our skin and block the pollutants to, uh, from getting to the skin. But then the active protectors are the antioxidants, the DNA repair enzymes and the like, the things that are really actively adding to our innate protection against environmental factors. If we look at the cosmeceutical realm today, we've got three categories of antioxidants that are found. We have the vitamins, primarily vitamin C and E, Lots of botanicals are now in cosmeceuticals, resveratrol, floritin, green tea polyphenols, grapeseed extract, ferulic acid, we could go on and on. Many, many uh, ingredients that uh, are botanical derived and have great antioxidant activity. 
And also we're seeing enzymatic antioxidants coming in cosmeceuticals, particularly superoxide dismutase. It might also be worth mentioning that these botanical antioxidants have very high ORAC values. So they do have a very um, high uh, antioxidant activity. It's, it's quite a bit higher than we see with the vitamin antioxidants, such as vitamin C and vitamin E. The very first topical antioxidants that were really extensively studied were vitamin C and vitamin E. And most of this work was done by Dr. Sheldon Pinnell, who at the time was the chair of the Department of Dermatology at Duke University. He looked at vitamin C alone in the beginning, but he later began experimenting with combinations of antioxidants and found to no surprise that combination of antioxidants were really more effective than single antioxidants alone, and that they were able to provide very significant protection against UV-induced damage in human skin. He was not at that time studying pollutants. I don't even think we were talking about pollutants at that time, but obviously we now know that uh, these also do a great job protecting against pollutants. So today, most of the daily defense antioxidant skincare products in the marketplace, and there are many cosmeceuticals that are positioned in this way, contain combinations of antioxidants. In this particular study, uh, Pinnell was looking at ferulic acid alone versus CE and CE ferulic, the combination of the three antioxidants. And as you can see, we're looking at sunburn protection here. The combination of the three antioxidants outperforms any of the individual ingredients or the combination of CE alone. And he demonstrated in this paper an eight-fold increase in photo protection against sunburn with the triple combination um, of antioxidants. He also showed mitigation of sunburn cells and probably most importantly, a reduction in some of those biomarkers that we know are upregulated in carcinogenesis. Things like P53 and thymine dimers and adoxyguanine. These can also be reduced by pre-treating human skin with combinations of antioxidants. Now, Dr. Giuseppe, I know you've studied some of these combination products in pollution, and I'd love for you to go through some of these studies for us. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Yes, because when you talk about pollution and skin damage, it's very hard to really extrapolate what is your daily life and if the damage that you actually have in your skin is really a consequence of a pollutant exposure or other sources like nutrition, just to go back to the exposome. So we were curious to understand, for example, if ozone is really affecting the skin and if we can prevent this damage. And we did the first human study on ozone and actually we had the subjects, 15 subjects that agree to put their <clears throat> arms under ozone. And after five days of exposure of the, uh, you know, a dose of ozone that you can find in polluted areas, we uh, took some biopsies and we analyzed the biopsies, not only for skin damage, but also we analyze on the fact to see if uh, actually topical application of mixed compounds could prevent the eventual damage. So it was very surprising first that, uh, as you can see from this data, that there was a very in clear and significant increase in uh, the molecule that I mentioned earlier on the peroxidation in the skin after just five days of exposure. But was even more surprisingly that you could almost quench this effect by the use of daily antioxidant application. This was not only for the uh, peroxidation products, but we saw this data also for pro-inflammatory markers such as NFKB, but also for cyclooxygenase 2 and even for metalloproteinase 9 that is well related to the formation of wrinkles. Even more striking was the data that show that the ozone was able to damage and, and make our skin lose some collagen while we were able through topical application to prevent this damage. So this was a, a very striking study. Of course, it's sometimes to understand better the molecular pathways involved in this mechanism, you can go to a more simple model. And a simple model is actually the 3D model that is uh, 
is like to have a skin in culture. And we did this exposure of uh, skin again uh, to ozone at different doses. And we want also to understand if sebum plays a role in preventing the damage. What we saw in the study, we confirmed that ozone is able to induce a peroxidation of the skin, any pro-inflammatory of the skin, that sebum actually does not help, it doesn't protect that, but actually maybe is even a substrate to make more damage to the skin. And as I summarize in the next slide, you can see how you have a 90% reduction of the damage that ozone is able to induce to the skin, and also 53% of the other compounds depends, on, of course, on the mixture. But the important is to have a mixture of antioxidants. And that is confirmed also in the next slides that you are able to prevent also the pro-inflammatory markers. And of course, there, is also, there are also other studies, not from our group, that confirm the fact that if you use a mix of antioxidant, for example, in this case, ferulic acid and vitamin E, uh, you are able to prevent uh, the induction of uh, the production of the spots of darkness of the skin. And that was uh, also a pretty um, a good uh, study. So the message is uh, it doesn't matter, you know, which product you use because uh, the market is full of products and it is impossible that you can test all of them. But a uh, what I say is that uh, you have to use uh, some topical application daily is more or less what you have to do, you know, for your teeth. You have to brush your teeth in the morning at least and before going to bed. And that is uh, actually what you should do for your skin. You have to protect when you wake up in the morning because you will have a whole day. But of course, during the day, your skin will accumulate uh, particulates, uh, dust, that uh, you have to get rid of that when you go to bed. So it's a very good if you actually wash well the skin and then you put some products that can also protect the skin during the night. Excellent, excellent contributions you've made to our body of science that we now understand uh, how these products work, what combinations of antioxidants can do to protect our skin. And um, I can't thank you enough for speaking with me today on this subject that I think you and I have been together in many rooms uh, and had long discussions about this. We're both passionate about environmental protection. So um, we hope today that you've uh, enjoyed our presentation and most importantly, learned about the current best practices for helping your patients to protect their skin against environmental aging. Uh, Giuseppe, again, thank you for this excellent discussion. And I wanna thank everybody for um, participating in this activity. You can continue on to answer the questions and follow up with the complete and complete the evaluation. We would appreciate it. And thank you very much.